So like Kara said, I, I do wildlife conservation for a living, and I don't want to start out by whining, but I need to tell you that it's hard. And it's hard because we focus on stuff that's disappearing. So often we don't know where they are or where they go or, or what they need to survive. So for species like these, even sometimes the most basic information can be really hard to find and a significant challenge. Often we re respond to that challenge with, with expensive high-tech options. This is an example from my past where we spent almost $200,000 in just 36 hours of catching pronghorn antelope. And on top of the expense, operations like this have their own environmental impacts and can be risky for the animals. They can also be risky for the people involved. This is the same helicopter that we used uh, just a few months later on a wolf capture uh, that ended prematurely in Idaho. Fortunately, everybody walked away, <coughs> or, sorry, lived, but, uh, but uh, had a chance to reflect on why we take the expensive, high-tech, invasive options. What we need is to think about a better way to get information, maybe better technology, something more flexible, less expensive, maybe safer for wildlife and people. And there it is. It's a dog's nose. And it's actually the best chemical sensor the world's ever known. And we can do some pretty amazing things with it. So it's surprising that it took us so long to realize dogs' potential. We domesticated each other probably about 50,000 years ago and they've been right under our noses. But it's only in the last few decades that we've actually started asking them what's under their noses. And it turns out there's quite a lot. So in the mid-90s, a handful of people came together and started learning about how to ask dogs questions and to find those elusive species. And as it turns out, we often don't even need to find or bother the species themselves. We can do pretty well finding what they leave behind. Because in many cases, there may just be one bear, but that bear leaves behind a lot of poop. And so our organization, Working Dogs for Conservation, was born. That's Megan Parker. She's one of the four women that co-founded the organization. And she's giving Pepin his paycheck. He gets paid with a wild tug on his, to uh, on his toy. And he tugs so wildly and so intensely that he generally rips it right out of her hands. And that intensity is what motivates a conservation detection dog to do its job and to tell us what they found. <laughs> that intensity is also makes them hard to, be, hard to handle as pets. And so most of our dogs come from shelters where their intensity also makes them a high risk for euth being euthanized. So for many of them at least, they save themselves by getting a job saving wildlife. So here's how they do that in a few places. In the Centennials, uh, dogs were able to find grizzly and wolf scats in places that they'd recolonized, <clears throat> but nobody had seen them. Those data helped move a 1,200 res home residential and golf development out of carnivore habitat, even though people hadn't seen the bears and wolves living there. The world's rarest ape, the Cross River Gorilla, lives in the highlands of Cameroon. They are so shy and the landscape is so rugged that conservationists knew next to nothing about where they were or what to do to, to help them. A census was possible from DNA that came from scats the dogs found, and the CDC was able to screen for both human and gorilla diseases. In California, dogs helped identify and protect habitat for the endangered San Joaquin kit fox, which is struggling to survive in the midst of residential and recreational development. And dogs are helping monitor kit fox numbers in what will become the world's largest solar farm. So they're able to make green energy a little greener for kit foxes. And that's no easy job because kit fox scats are tiny. It's that little white raisin there. And Rio and, his, and, and the other dogs found almost 1,300 of them during the course of field work. <clears throat> and can you guess how many times they were right? Every single time, 100%, which is far better than, than, than people can do. So in addition to being more accurate, they're, they're actually much more efficient as well. Anywhere from five to almost 40 times more efficient than people or camera traps or, or hair snares. So they can speed us up, but they also can make us even more effective. And here are a couple examples of those. Seamus here is trained to detect invasive weeds. He kept alerting where weeds had been removed and pulled out, and we thought that it was just residual scent that he was finding. But then in the very places where he was alerting, the weeds actually re-sprouted. <laughs> so leave it to a border collie to point out that we had the science wrong. <laughs> Back to the Centennials, as bears were recolonizing that area, a lot of people thought that every time they saw a bear, they, he was going to cause problems, and a lot of bears died that way. 
Dogs were able to document that there were far more bears in that area than anyone realized, and most of them weren't causing any problems. So at the same time, they were able to help landowners be more tolerant and more vigilant about keeping livestock safe. We're not the only ones doing amazing things with dogs. Dogs can help diabetics or veterans with PTSD, and Daisy in the middle there can detect any of five different kinds of cancer from a woman's breath sample, and she does it earlier and more accurately than lab diagnostics. We're really hard pressed to find things that dogs can't detect, and so we keep asking them to find harder and harder things. Some people said that metal doesn't have enough smell, so dogs wouldn't be able to find poacher's wire snares in Africa. Well, Pepin didn't get the memo, and so <laughs> he's done so well that he'll be heading to Zambia and Botswana next month to pilot a, a snare detection and removal program. <laughs> Pepin's also found a number of scats in the water, so we started asking, well, maybe we can, he can find other stuff there. So later this summer, he and a couple other dogs will start looking for aquatic contaminants uh, and in aquatic invasive species. Uh, they'll look for heavy metals, fire retardants, and even pharmaceuticals. So given all that they're capable of, it's no surprise that a bunch of Montana shelter dogs have become globetrotting conservation heroes. These are some of the, the places and species that dogs from just our organization have worked on in the last 15 years. And you can embed that the field will grow even more quickly over the next 15 years. So conservation will always be hard, but it's clear that dogs can help us be more efficient and more effective and even more ethical as we do it. And we're really lucky to have the world's best conservation dogs right here in Montana. So I hope you'll all get to know us and our dogs and most importantly, the amazing things they do. Thanks. Yeah.